left by himself like that, not even deemed worthy of an answer, our taxities went away, seething with all kinds of emotion. He was angry with Calerho, sorry for himself, and frightened of the king, who perhaps would not even believe that he had spoken to Calerho at all, even though without success he might think he was betraying his charge to please the queen. He was also afraid that Calerho would even report this conversation to the queen and that Tatira would be angry and devise some serious trouble for him, thinking he was not serving the king's passion, but actually promoting it. The eunuch then, for his part, went to wondering how he could safely report to the king what had happened. As for Calerho, when she was by herself, she said, This is what I foresaw would happen. Euphrates, you are my witness. I said I shall never cross you again. Goodbye, my father, and you, my mother, and Syracuse, my home. I shall never see you again. Now Calerho truly is dead. I left my tomb once. Not even the pirate Theron will take me from here now. My beauty, my treacherous beauty. You are the cause of all my troubles. It was because of you that I was carried off and sold. Because of you that I married another after Chariots. Because of you that I was taken to Babylon and brought into a courtroom. How many times have you handed me over? To pirates? To the sea? To the tomb? Slavery? Judgment? But the heaviest burden I have had to bear is the king's love and I have not even mentioned the king's anger yet. To me, yet more frightening is the queen's jealousy. Not even Charius could endure jealousy. The man though he is, and Greek though he is, what will it do to a woman, an oriental queen? Come, Calerho, conceive some plan of noble kind worthy of Hippocrates. Kill yourself, but no, not yet. So far, this is the first approach you have had, and it comes from a eunuch. If some more violent thing happens, that will be the time to show Charius, in his presence, how loyal you are. The eunuch went to the king and tried to hide the truth about what had happened. He gave the excuse that he had been busy and had been keeping careful watch on the queen. As a result, he had not even been able to approach Calerho. You told me to make sure no one saw me, sir, and you were quite right to do so. You have assumed the very dignified role of judge, and you want to have the good opinion of Persia. That is why everyone sings your praises. But Greeks find fault over trifles, and they gossip. They will spread this business all over. Calerho will boast that the king loves her, and Dionysius and Charius will give vent to their jealousy. Besides, it is not fair to cause pain to the queen, whom has the trial has made more beautiful than she was already reputed to be. He began to insert this recantation into his words in the hope that he could turn the king away from his passion and remove a difficult duty from his own shoulders. Well, for the moment, he managed to persuade him. But when night came, the king once more inflamed with passion. Love kept on reminding him what eyes Calerho had, how lovely her face was. He, com he, recomm he commended her hair, her walk, her voice, the way she entered the courtroom, the way she stood, her manner of speaking, her manner of not speaking, her blushes, her tears. He lay awake most of the night, and when he snatched a little sleep, it was only to dream of Calerho. The next morning he sent for the eunuch. Go and be on the alert near her all day, he said. You are bound to find a chance to talk to her, even if only for a moment, without anyone noticing. If I wanted to slake my desire openly and by force, I have guards available. The eunuch made obeisance and promised to do so. 
When the king commands, none may argue. He knew that Calarho would not give an opening, but would evade any conversation by purposely staying in the queen's company. And in order to deal with just that maneuver, he shifted the responsibility from the woman thus protected to the one protecting her. Sir, he said, please send for Tatira and say that you want to talk privately with her. Her absence will give me access to Calarho. Act accordingly, said the king. Our taxates went to the queen, made obeisance, and said, Madam, your husband summons you. On hearing this, Tatira signified her obedience with a bow and hurried off to the king. The eunuch saw Calarho left by herself, took her hand in a manner suggesting his goodwill toward Greeks and all mankind, and led her away from the crowd of attendant women. Calarho knew what he wanted. She at once went pale and fell silent, but she followed him. When they were alone, he said to her, you have just seen how the queen bowed in obedience when she heard the king's name and went off with all speed. But you, his slave, cannot accept your good fortune. You are not satisfied that he invites you where he could command. But I respect you, and I have not reported your crazy behavior to him. On the contrary, I have made a promise on your behalf, so you have two ways open to you choose which will you will take. I will tell you what those two ways are. Either you do what the king wants, in which case you will have magnificent presence and the husband of your choice, for I hardly imagine he is going to marry you himself, or you will merely afford him momentary gratification. Or else, if you do not do what he wants, you know what happens to the king's enemies. They are the only people who are not permitted to die even when they want to. Calarho laughed in his face at this threat. It will not be my first experience of suffering, she said. I am acquainted with misfortune. What disposition can the king make for me that would be worse than I have already suffered? I have been buried alive. The tomb is narrower than any prison cell. I have been delivered into the hands of pirates, and now I am suffering the worst of my torments. Charius is near me, and I cannot see him. The last remark betrayed her. The eunuch was an intelligent man, and he saw that she was in love. Foolish woman, he cried, do you prefer a slave of Mithridates to the king? Calarho bridled at the insult to Charius. Hold your tongue, you wretch, she cried. Charis is nobly born. He is the foremost man in a city that even Athens could not overcome. And Athens overcame that great king of yours at Marathon and Salamis. As she said this, she burst into tears, and the eunuch pressed her harder. The delay is your own fault, he said. It is assuredly better to gain the judge's goodwill so as to win your husband back as well. Charius may never even know what happened. Even if he does, he will not be jealous of his superior. You will think you will be all the more precious to him for pleasing the king. They think he is a god come among mankind, but Calarho would not have welcomed Zeus himself as a husband or preferred immortality to one day with Charius. The eunuch then, unable to make any headway, said, Lady, I will give you a chance to think about it, but you, sh but you should not consider yourself alone, but Charius as well. He is in danger of dying a miserable death. The king will not tolerate being outdone in love. With that he left, but Calarho took his final words to heart.